All right, thank you very much. And I want to thank the organizer, uh, our organizers for putting together this uh, very enjoyable workshop and for inviting me. Um, today I'm going to talk about evolutionary dynamics of drug resistance. And I'm splitting up the talk into um, two parts. Um, the first part I want to explore, can we use evolutionary models in a clinically useful way to potentially make patient-specific predictions? And we've been talking um, about uh, usefulness of mathematical models, whether, whether we can make them more useful in the clinic. And so I want to address that a little bit. I want to do that in the context of a leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The reason being that I think this is a, a tumor where you can measure a lot of parameters, where you can follow the dynamics quite closely. And so it gives us advantages over other tumors um, in, in trying to achieve this goal. Then, and, and this is resistance against targeted small molecule inhibitors. Um, and then the second part of the talk I will talk about a different type of drug resistance, which is stem cell-based drug resistance. Stem cells are naturally resistant uh, to killing by drugs such as chemotherapy. And I want to explore that and the evolution of that in the context of um, bladder cancer. So we'll start to get going with a um, leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the most common leukemia um, in the Western world. And Treatment has made significant advances over the last year. So you, you may be familiar with um, targeted treatment of um, CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, with, with Gleevec that transformed that treatment. Similarly here, we have targeted drugs, small molecule inhibitors, that have really transformed the treatment of this disease. Previously, you would use chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy, but um, now um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been developed that directly attack um, a defect in, in the tumor cells, and it's really um, going, going very well. It's very effective. So it's a, this tumor is a, a tumor of the B cells. B cells are those cells that produce antibodies in the immune system. Um, and it, it is uh, driven by continuous signaling to the B cell receptor that drives the cells into division. And um, there is a thing called BTK, um, Bruton, uh, Bruton tyrosine kinase. This is um, one of the key components in driving the signaling, and you can inhibit that, what is called B abbreviated BTK, by drugs. One of these drugs is called ibrutinib. There are a couple now that do similar things. You inhibit that signaling, and therefore you disrupt the um, ability of these cells to proliferate. You can induce death in these cells, and you, you also interfere with the interaction of the tumor cell with a microenvironment. So the tumor cell, the, their, the action is happening in the bone marrow and in the tissues, such as the, uh, the lymphoid tissues, the lymph nodes and the spleen. And in there, they interact with various cells, nurse-like cells. And this interaction keeps them alive and keeps them dividing. And so the drug also interferes with those interactions with the microenvironment. So as I said, most of the action happens in the tissue, bone marrow and the lymphoid tissue. But we can measure these things in the blood. So the cells spill over, they come out of the tissues, they come into the blood. Um, in the blood, nothing much happens. Cells don't replicate in the blood, um, but they tend to go back in the tissue, and all the action happens in the tissue. So these drugs, particularly ibrutinib, came along. This is what you observe when you look in the blood. When you start treatment, you first see an increase in the number of tumor cells, followed by a significant decrease, and then it stabilizes at some constant level. The increase happens because uh, the cells get flushed out of the tissues. You give the drug, it interferes with the interaction with the microenvironment. They can't really, then they can't really stay very well in the tissues anymore. They, they, they get flushed out in the blood. So you see this increase. Whoops. Oh. Yeah, you see, you see the increase, and then they, they die. And, and, and they, then they stabilize. It's unclear why they stabilize in the end. They, it, it's not driven further down. Um, that, that's subject to um, research. But in the long term, so you see this flat line here. Um, many patients are being treated for long periods of time and, and are doing well. But as you go on over time, more and more patients try, start to relapse. And this relapse is driven by the emergence of drug resistant mutants. And so one thing that we wanted to do is, is to ask, can we predict how long is this treatment going to be successful? How long is tumor control going to, be, going to be lasting? And when can we expect the rise due to drug resistance? Can we predict that for specific patients and then tailor the treatment um, to maximize the treatment? Okay. So what is drug resistance here? Drug resistance is basically brought about by point mutations 
uh, mostly in the BTK that is targeted in cell. So you get a mutation in the drug binding site, the drug can't bind anymore, and the cell is resistant. There are also downstream mutations um, that have a similar effect, but they all um, point mutations. What is the effect of these mutations on the fitness of cells in the absence of the drug? It is unclear, we don't really know. So default assumption, we say they're neutral. There are some arguments saying that they actually can be advantageous because they can metabolize more efficiently than, uh, than, than the sensitive cells, but that's, we, we, we don't really know. So what we did is looked at the basic mathematical model of um, evolution. It's a basic birth-death process, and I think we heard yesterday um, already um, something about th these sort of approaches. So a cell has a probability to divide, it has a probability to die. If the division probability is larger than the death probability, you get clonal expansion of the cell population. If it's the other way around, you get a shrinkage um, due to treatment. And during division, there's a certain probability that a mutation is generated, um, that is point mutation probability, so somewhere between 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 9 per um, base per, 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 gener per generation. So that's the basic um, model that we're, that we're looking at. So we have the following scenario. You can simulate this growth starting from low numbers. You get expansion of the clones. This is the tumor growing. During this growth, the mutation happens. This is a stochastic process. Um, mutations can rise a little bit. They can shrink a little bit. They can go extinct. There's these dynamics going on, stochastic evolutionary dynamics. And at a certain size, which we call n, um, you start treatment, then the sensitive cells start to shrink, but if there are resistant cells around, or resistant cells are generated later, they will, they will grow out um, and give rise to this relapse. So that's a fairly standard framework, and we've applied that framework to this particular problem. So let's talk about parameters. How can we me measure parameters? This tumor lends itself to measuring parameters. One thing that I haven't mentioned so far is that when a patient is diagnosed with a tumor, you don't put that patient on treatment right away. You only put that patient on treatment when the bone marrow gets impacted sufficiently that you have to treat. So you have a relatively long phase where you can actually observe this disease and quantify the dynamic. And so what can be, what can be done is you can um, give heavy water to patients to drink, that's a DNA label, that gets taken up and then you can follow the label dynamics and based on this label dynamics you can calculate the division rates and, and, and the death rates of the cell. So typically what you see during this natural growth phase is the tumor grows exponentially and you can calculate the doubling time of this if you know the division rate from, from, from the labeling, you can calculate the death rates and so we have a good idea about the kinetics. You can do that for each individual patient, you can look at the heterogeneity of these parameters across different patients and quantify that. And we've, we, we've done that and we got uh, good numbers for that. You can also quantify the treatment response uh, quite precisely and there are many parameters that one can measure, but you can concentrate on, on, on a few of them. So one is we need to know the total tumor burden in the body. How, much of this, how many tumor cells are in the body across the different, the different sites? What is the death rates of these cells in the tissue, in the blood? Um, what is that redistribution rate when you treat, when they get flushed out in the blood? So these are all treatment parameters that we can measure. We've got two types of data. The first we have in, in the blood. Um, in the blood, the number of tumor cells first goes up, goes down, and stabilizes, as I mentioned. You can fit mathematical models of sort of compartments of tissue and blood to those data and try to get some of the parameters at the same time. We also quantify the number of cells in tissue and these patients, these are patients in, in MD Anderson Cancer Center, they have been um, evaluated by CT scans before treatment and by CT scans during treatment and you can get the total volume of, of, of these um, tissues and since they're packed with tumor cells essentially we know the, roughly the volume of a tumor cell, you can kind of estimate slash guesstimate the, the number of cells in the, in, in the total in the total um, lymphoid compartments. And this is before treatment, you can see they are large, during treatment, lymph nodes shrink. So you can parameterize the system quite precisely and get these, these kind of um, parameters. So, so and, and this is for individual patients. And so we, we have a situation where we can follow the dynamics over time we, and we can measure patient-specific parameters in, 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 in an amount of detail that I haven't been able to do in, in other tumors. So one of the problems with this study is there's a lot of, there's a lot of work and there are not that many patients. Um, that's always a problem. Um, but we have a certain number of patients and, and, and we can take these parameters and we can use that parameter space that we observe to make virtual patients. And so out of these, by randomly drawing parameters from, from the available data, 
um, we created a thousand artificial patients to explore the evolutionary dynamics and to explore what kind of outcomes, what kind of dynamics are possible. This has its own problems if parameters are correlated with each other, that random drawing is not great, but it's, it's something one can, one, one, one can try and do. So the first question is that, that, that we're asking is as, as this tumor grows to a certain size n, how many um, drug resistant cells are going to be there? Are they going to be there even when you start treatment? Do drug resistant cells pre-exist? That's always an Im Im important question and we can, well, that can be calculated. This is the tumor size. We know the tumor size from the radiological data is about 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 13, 14 in, in, in that area. The mutation rate uh, um, is point mutation rate, so we're looking at 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. Um, and so in that region, these numbers, there's a probability that a drug-resistant mutant pre-exists before therapy, and it's essentially one. So from, from that, we can really conclude that drug-resistant mutants are going to be there when you start treatment, which is not that surprising because it's been observed in, in, in several other systems um, as well, not only cancer, but also viral infection. So that's the situation that we have. Um, tumor grows to a certain size. Resistant mutants are going to stochastically evolve. They're going to be present at a certain level. And then, then we ask if we start out with that level, we treat, obviously the, the, the sensitive cells are going to go away. The resistant cells are going to start growing. Um, and at some point, they reach a threshold where you will be able to see the relapse. So the question is, how long does it take from here to here? Which is, how long are we able to control that tumor without seeing relapse? Can we make prediction based on those parameter space that we, that we have? I keep clicking the wrong, there you go. And this is now these growth, predicted growth curves of the resistant mutants during treatment for different parameters within that virtual parameter space. That, that we have. This black line here is 10 to the 10 cells. This is probably when we start seeing the relapse. And so you can see that there's a huge heterogeneity based on the parameters in the time until we hit 10 to the, the resistant mutant hit 10 to the 10 cells, which is the time to relapse. Um, some of them relapse after a year or two, or are predicted to relapse. Others are predicted to relapse um, or not relapse um, during a period of, of 10 years um, or longer. So there's a huge amount of heterogeneity driven by heterogeneity in the parameters across um, patients. And so each line is the average dynamics of the resistant mutant based on one parameter set, on one virtual patient. Okay? So this is the average dynamics. And this gives rise to a question. We're looking at average dynamics here, but in each patient, it's a stochastic process. So is it meaningful to take a parameter set for a given patient and say, on average, we expect this trajectory. Is that meaningful for that, for that patient? For that, we need to quantify the variability in the, in the outcomes. So that's restating what I just said. Is this average meaningful or not? So we looked at some measures. We looked at the number of mutants at the start of treatment. We know that their mutants are almost certainly there. Um, so what's the, number of average num what's the distribution of the number of mutants at the start of treatment? There's a huge variability. These are two different parameter combinations. But you can see that the standard deviation is an order of magnitude larger than the, than, than, than the mean. So if you look at the number of mutants that exist at the start of treatment, there's an enormous amount of variation, and that's expected as well. But now if you look at a different measure, which is clinically more important, this is the time until resistance is detected, the time until this resistant population has grown from low numbers to the 10 to the 10 cells. Now we see that the standard deviation is an order of magnitude less than the mean. And the reason is that the time until it hits the threshold is um, determined by the log of the number of mutants at the start of treatment. So although there's a large variability in the number of mutants when you start treatment, there's much less variability in the time it takes for these mutants to um, go to a threshold. And that's because we're observing they're growing essentially exponentially. Okay? So that's good news because we think that if you take a parameter from a patient and you look at the average trajectory of the resistant mutant, you can make a meaningful prediction about how long this um, control is going to last. And we quantified that for the, uh, for the, parameter, for the virtual parameter set that, that we have. And we again see quite a bit of heterogeneity. Um, some people, small percentage, relapse right away. Another don't relapse, small percentage after more than 30 years. And there's stuff um, in between. And so this gives rise to an important um, task for modeling, can we predict for each individual patient before we 
they're, they're put on, on therapy, how long this treatment is going to last and be successful. And if it's not successful for a long time, can we intervene in different ways? Can we make decisions based on the model? So that's the sort of the, the decision um, tree here. If you, you, you use the model to predict how long this therapy with ibrutinib can lead to control. If, if it is determined by the model that it is a long time, for example, 10 years, then we can just give that one drug to the patient and, and the patient will be fine for a long time. We don't have to worry about it. However, if the model predicts that relapse is going to be there in, in within one year, then other approaches might be needed to, um, uh, do, to, to, to treat better. And so we, to demonstrate that how, how one uses that, we did um, play around with a few things. You can, in, in, in these cases where you need to do other things, you could think of, we could treat early and not use the watch and wait, but as soon as you're diagnosed, treat. You could combine two tyrosine kinase inhibitors, okay? Increases side effects, might be a problem, but can it help? Or the other thing you can do is you can debulk, which means you first treat with chemotherapy, knock everything down, and then treat with the targeted drugs, and then you might have less resistant mutants around, and it takes longer for these resistant mutants to, to grow. And so when you do these things, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, still going to be a problem, still going to be resistant, not, not, not very good, but the debulking thing could actually um, work. So we explored that. This is the original sort of distribution of relapse times. This is assuming that you debulk with chemotherapy before ibrutinib treatment. You debulk by a factor of 100. And you can see that the uh, fraction of cases that, la that, that control longer than 30 years is, is increased. Those that relapse very fast are decreased. So overall, you get a shift in favor of the patient, a significant shift. And so we think this approach could be used in the clinic. If, we, if, if one can measure the parameters for each patient, you can feed them the, the heavy water, you can try to radiologically determine the total tumor size, determine some treatment parameters, and we can say this is, it's, going to, it's going to last this and this long, then we can try to make clinical decisions based, based on that. So for that, to, 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 to develop this further, we will need additional validation. Of, of this model, and maybe we have to incorporate more complexities into it, such as spatial or frag fragmented cell populations, especially fragmented populations, because I mentioned the tumor is in the lymph nodes. There are many different lymph nodes across the body, so we've got kind of patch model going on there, and, and, and this is something we're currently um, looking at. So this is the first part of the talk. Then I want to switch topic and look at stem cell-based resistance. So this leukemia business was talking about what I consider standard resistance, you get a mutation, these mutations are resistant, they, they grow out. But there's also an example of resistance where you don't find mutants that are intrinsically resistant to the therapy. And this can be mediated by stem cells, because stem cells um, are less susceptible to treatment, are less susceptible um, to cell death. So we study this in the context of bladder cancer. This is a cancer that's studied by our collaborator, Keith, Keith Chan at Cedars, and we try to um, evaluate that quantitatively. So this is the data that, the kind of data that Keith Chan has. What we're looking at are patient-derived xenografts. They so take a tumor out of a patient, put them on the back of the mouse, they start growing it on the mouse. In the mouse, you can treat with regimes that are similar to what's happening in the, in the patient. So you have repeated phases of chemotherapy that are in gray here, and you can see here initially the tumor responds, goes down, but as you go on, the tumor stops responding as you treat with more chemotherapy. It, that, but essentially, the tumor doesn't decline anymore. So, so what, is, what is going on here? Um, there seem to be no resistant mutants present. So there seems to be this sort of non-genetic resistance. And there's heterogeneity in different, in different tumors if you grow them on the, on the mouse. So you can see here, you see limited responses initially even, but the, they get even smaller with repeated chemotherapy. Here is a, is, is a case where you have much stronger treatment responses and they don't decline that much during treatment. This is just two cycles, but these are very, very strong um, responses. Sometimes in rare cases, you can even eliminate the, the, the tumor by, by chemotherapy. So what can explain this decline of responsiveness over time? And what can explain this heterogeneity? So we set out to study that. And we um, started off with the arguments that, that Keith, our collaborator, had. So he had, he had a study. Where he, where he tried to figure this out experimentally. And so you have stem cells that can be quiescent, that can be activated, that differentiate into differentiated cells. Now you kill by chemotherapy. When you kill the cells by chemotherapy, you hit mostly the differentiated cells. This results, seems to result in the release of factors that are similar to, wound, to a wound healing signal. And that wound healing signal then tells 
the stem cells to come out of quiescence and to proliferate. So you've got this repopulation of the stem cells, increased division rate of the stem cells during chemotherapy, which is kind of a feedback mechanism. You kill the differ differentiated cells, they release the signal, and that results in accelerated stem cell proliferation. So that's a cool story that he put together. And this is the, the data that shows that these are control. The triangles are control mice. The tumor just grows. And then this is the chemotherapy-treated tumor. So you, 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 knock it, you, you knock it down initially, but this knocking down becomes less effective as you continue with further treatments. This is a drug uh, is added here that not, there's not only chemotherapy, but also something that blocks the wound healing response, this telecoxin. And you see that the result of the treatment is much better because you seem to prevent that repopulation going on. You prevent driving these stem cells into proliferation, and therefore the tumor um, is lower. So this seems to be a pretty neat story where um, the treatment response is lost due to chemotherapy, um, but that the treatment response is partially restored if you block that wound healing response. So this feedback, this wound healing response, seems to be an integral part of the story that makes the cancer less susceptible to chemotherapy. So this is the experimental story that we were facing. The experiments told us that there's this wound healing response going on. This wound healing response drives the stem cells into proliferation, that enriches the stem cells, and that makes the whole tumor much more stem cell rich and therefore less susceptible to treatment. Um, whenever experimentalists um, have a hypothesis and they, sh they, they, sh they show us data, we always feel it's necessary to, to look into it in more detail and to test this hypothesis with mathematical models because the mathematical models can really show us is this an explanation that can really work or is there more going on here, okay? So we made a model that recapitulates essentially that. You have quiescent stem cells, stem cells, transit amplifying cells, differentiated cells, and the differentiated cells can die and upon death, they can um, make that wound healing signal that drives stem cells into proliferation. So this is the model. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but essentially, I think we, that this captures this experimental argument that was put forward. And then we can simulate things. And the black line is an untreated line of a tumor. Um, the green line here is where you have repeated cycles of chemotherapy, but without um, uh, wound healing, and, and so you see it gets knocked down temporarily and keeps growing. But if you add um, this wound healing response that is suggested to drive this, you can see that the, the tumor can actually do worse than, than, than untreated because you keep, doing, you, you keep driving those um, cells, the stem cells, into proliferation. However, this graph is more important. You can see that during treatment, the stem cells are knocked, uh, un, are, uh, the differentiated cells are knocked down. And during treatment, the stem cells become dominant. It becomes stem cell enriched. But then you take the treatment away, the system re-equilibrates to where it was before, where there are mostly differentiated cells and a small fraction of the stem cells. So it seems to be that this fraction of the stem cells in this model does not increase with treatment. And you can look at the percent of the tumor that gets re reduced with each treatment cycle. This does not decline like we've seen in the data. This stays constant with each treatment cycle. So the overall susceptibility of the tumor remains identical with each treatment cycle. In the data we saw that with each treatment cycle, the tumor responds less and less. So with this model, we cannot recapitulate the experimental data. And therefore, that's a very valuable thing that the model can do. We can kind of reject the hypothesis that this wound healing response alone drives the dynamics. There must be more going on. And so we started asking, how can we modify this model so that it recapit recapitulates the experimental data with more accuracy? So the reason we think why this fails to recapitulate the data is that during tumor growth, there's no stem cell enrichment occurring. So if the tumor grows naturally, this is the stem cells, this is the differentiated cells, the fraction remains constant. Therapy essentially knocks the populations down, then they regrow. If during regrowth there's no enrichment going on, then, then, then um, nothing is going to happen. So what we think might be going on is that there are other feedback loops in the tumor going on. These are remnants of the original tissue. Um, there's negative feedback going on in regular tissues that controls homeostasis. Um, it's very possible that some of these negative feedback loops remain and do something. And in particular, we looked at a negative feedback where differentiated cells then secrete factors that reduce the division rate of stem cells, that reduce the division rate of um, transit amplifying cells. And these are feedback loops that have been documented experimentally in tissues um, generally, and so they could very well be present. Um, in the tumor. So what happens when you, 
add these sort of negative feedback loops to the model, to the tumor model. What happens is this is tumor growth in the absence of treatment. You can see that during growth, the stem cells enrich over time and eventually become dominant over the differentiated cells. So during growth, during natural growth already, you see significant amounts of stem cell enrichment. Now we put that into the treatment thing and we find that the model can now reproduce the kind of data that we're seeing in those mice. So you can see here that, well again, it, treatment makes it worse than untreated and much more so than, than in the other model. And importantly, you can see that, of course, initially differentiated cells decline and, and stem cells are, are higher, but when you stop the treatment, it doesn't re-equilibrate to where it was before. It goes to a different equilibrium where the fraction of stem cells is permanently altered and stays. And with each treatment, you increase the fraction of stem cells and you get this enrichment that continues um, with each treatment cycle and gets worse. And as a consequence, the fraction of the tumor that responds to treatment gets lower and lower and lower with each treatment cycle. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the data. So we're hypothesizing that in addition to this wound healing response, you also have to have negative feedback signals in order um, for the decline of the responsiveness to, to be seen. And the heterogeneity might be explained by different levels of this negative feedback happening. Some tumors may not have any negative feedback going on. They, they may then not lose treatment response. They may be much more sensitive. And those that have significant amounts of this negative feedback, they may lose responsiveness much faster. So that's our um, hypothesis. We've done all of this based on, on ordinary differential equations. So we did all of everything spatial, of course, in tumors, especially a xenograft. Um, did all this in a 3D space and essentially, um, long story short, we, we observe the same dynamics. Um, treatment response is lost, stem cell fraction goes up with each treatment cycle. So again, consistent with the data. So we wanted to know, just to sort of finish up, is there any value to this hypothesis? Now we can reproduce the data, doesn't mean this hypothesis is correct. Is this negative feedback really the, an, an important determinant of treatment sensitivity? So how can we get a handle on this? I think we can try to get an initial handle of this by looking at the dynamics of the tumor in the absence of um, treatment, just natural growth. Okay? So if you have no negative feedback, um, you see a relatively fast growth. This is going back to ODE, so here you see exponential kind of growth happening, going up. But as you add more and more negative feedback to the model, this becomes more and more sub-exponential, the growth. The growth, de growth deviates from, from exponential. So we looked at the xenograft tumors before they were treated. We know which ones are sensitive, we know which ones are resistant. And so those that are sensitive seem to be growing much more exponentially, those that are resistant seem to be growing much more sub-exponentially. So we think that this is preliminary data that indicates that maybe there is a difference in feedback that's going on, that those that are resistant have more feedback, which is seen by the sub-exponential growth in the absence of treatment. And those that are more sensitive, they grow exponentially, so they probably have less feedback or no feedback, and, th and then that's why they're um, more sensitive, right? So, so, so maybe there's something there that's preliminary data. We want to explore that um, going forward with detailed experiments and, and, and quantify that better. So negative feedback, just to finish off, negative feedback, I showed you one loop. Differentiated cells secrete a signal that reduce the rate of proliferation. But in a tumor, as in, an, in, a, in a tissue, there can be all sorts of feedback loops going on. Um, and this is what this messy diagram indicates. There can be all sorts of configurations of control loops that are happening. Um, factors can, see, feedback factors can be secreted from stem cells, they can be secreted from differentiated cells, they can affect proliferation rates, they can affect probability to self-renew, they can affect death rates, and so there's complexity there. So when we're looking in a more general scenario, um, is it this one feedback loop that we considered, is that the only possibility that can result in stem cell enrichment and reproduce the data, or are there more of them? And so looking at the general analysis, we found that there are more of them. Well, feedback on division rate is, is one of them. Feedback, um, a positive feedback on the death rate of differentiated, cell, differentiated cells can have a similar effect. And these factors can either be secreted by stem cells or by differentiated cells. And so this gives us a map of the types of feedback that we're looking for that could explain this. And now we're trying to go in, to, in more detail into the tumor and see are these feedback loops present. We're looking at proteomics approaches to try to identify um, specific factors that might be there that might be doing um, what the model tells us 
they, they should be doing. And, and, and from there, we hope to get a better understanding what causes the stem cell enrichment. And once we understand that, if there's a difference in feedback, can we then use that to predict which patient is going to respond better? And can we then use that information to uh, make treatment outcomes better if, 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 the, if, if responsiveness is lost? And that sum, sums it up. So I want to thank group members and collaborators, Natalia and math department, um, Keith Chan at Cedars doing the bladder experiments, and, and um, um, Jan Berger at MD Anderson doing the leukemia stuff. Thank you very much.